stories about algorithms in algebraic number theory. Yesterday I talked about approximating the ring of integers of a given algebraic number field. That was maybe not a very easy lecture, but that is why you had an afternoon off. And in order to compensate for this, I want to have something today that is much more intelligible. The main subject will be generalizing the co-prime base algorithm that I talked about and will remind you of in the first lecture, generalizing it to ideals. But I want to start by discussing an example that I mentioned previously. So I take an algebraic number in my field and I assume just to avoid degenerate cases that it is not a rational number, so it is an algebraic number. I do not assume it is an algebraic integer and the degree I call it n and it is at least 2. And then what I told you is that if you like to make the ideal generated by 1 and gamma invertible, in other words, if you want to find the least ring over which this is happening, then what you should take is the ring generated by gamma intersected with the ring generated by gamma inverse. Neither of these needs to be an order, but the intersection is an order. And I will give you more explicit information about this order in the first part of my lecture. And if you like, you may see that this is equal to Z gamma itself if and only if Z gamma is contained in Z gamma inverse. In other words, if and only if gamma is contained in Z gamma inverse, which is the case if you just write it out, if and only if gamma is an algebraic integer, so belongs to OK. And if it is not an algebraic integer, well, then its inverse might still be an algebraic integer, and then the ring that we are talking about will be generated by the inverse. There is always a symmetry in what I'm saying about this ring between gamma and gamma inverse. I can multiply this group by gamma inverse without changing the blow up. Okay, now what I will first do is tell you a perfectly explicit basis over Z for this ring. I will call this ring A in a moment, and I need some space for this. I think that I will use two blackboards as if they are one, and I will look at this relation satisfied by gamma. Oh, I forgot to introduce it. So F in Zx that is the irreducible polynomial of gamma. And I mean by irreducible that it is irreducible as an element of this ring. I am not requiring that it is monic, but I do want the coefficients to be integers. And being irreducible, f will not be divisible by any prime number. So that means that the GCD of the coefficients is equal to 1. The AI generate Z as a group. So I'm now writing down this relation for gamma. And that is given by the vanishing of this polynomial. 
and this is equal to zero, but I will give it a further special name, namely Pn, because it is an expression of degree n. And on this blackboard, I do the corresponding things for gamma inverse, but I do it in the other order, and you will see what I mean by that. So I just write down the last coefficient, and that is a expression of degree zero, and therefore I call it Q0. And then Pn minus one, I get by dividing this expression by gamma, so that is a n to the gamma plus n minus one, and then you keep going, a n minus one, gamma n minus two, and at the end, well, there's the a one gamma, and I stop at the a one because on this blackboard, I do not like to have negative powers of gamma, but they are happy to appear on the other blackboard, and I repeat the last term, and then I have A0 to the power gamma inverse, which I call Q1, because it is of degree 1 in gamma inverse. And in this way, you continue, so let me write down at the end what you see here, you have P1, which is a n gamma plus a n minus one. Here we have a n minus one plus, well, and then you keep going until you have an expression of degree n minus one in Q inverse. So that is my Q n minus one. And the last thing that is simply the leading coefficient of a of my polynomial f, and here we get the, uh, uh, this is a n, sorry about that, the leading coefficient is a n, and here you get the relation satisfied by gamma inverse, which is simply the same polynomial read backwards. So that is q n, which is zero. Okay. Now, one of the easy observations here that we are generalizing is that if you look at this gamma, well, it need not be an algebraic integer. It will be an algebraic integer if and only if that leading coefficient a n is equal to plus one or minus one. But in the general case, this a n will not be zero because f is of degree n. And it is very easy to show that if you multiply gamma by a n, so that is this expression here, that it, then that is an algebraic integer. And therefore also this p1 is an algebraic integer and this p1 is p0. Okay, and actually, all these p's are algebraic integers, and we look at the group they generate, and I call it capital D. So capital D is generated by these n plus one elements, but I can omit the first one, which is zero, and all the others, they have different degrees in gamma, so they will be linearly independent over the rationals, and I get, therefore, a direct sum of the z times pi. That is a group, and it is called d, because at a certain moment, it will play the role of a denominator, the denominator of my gamma. Okay, that is something that will become clear. Here I do the symmetric thing, that is just the same story with gamma inverse in the place of gamma. And that is called n, because it is the numerator of gamma, as you will discover. And if you interchange gamma and gamma inverse, then clearly numerators and denominators switch place. What is the question? 
Why is the sum direct? The sum is direct because all these expressions as polynomials in gamma have different degrees. And gamma has degree n, so in the number field the powers of gamma are linearly independent from the zeroth one up to the n minus first one. And since the a n are non-zero, is non-zero, these are also linearly independent, right? Okay, good, thanks. And the a naught is also non-zero because gamma uh, is not zero. Gamma is of degree at least two. So the same story is valid on the other blackboard. Okay. Now there is one thing that we should observe, and that is that if you add one of the p's that you see on this blackboard to the q that is sitting in the same line, then you see, well, the top line, uh, this one is zero, and here you get a zero. And this p n minus one, if you add up these two expressions on this line, then you get the a1, but if you leave out the a1, you simply get the relation satisfied by gamma, except that the whole thing has been multiplied by gamma inverse. And the same is happening throughout the table. So here you see that this sum is just an integer, an ordinary integer. And this implies that if I work modulo integers, then these groups are the same. D plus Z is equal to N plus Z. And this is really the hero of the story, and I will tell you why. There is some interesting set of identities that you get when you multiply together two of these p's, and I do not want to write it down. It is all written in the notes, and it is sort of uh, easy. In fact, uh, you may view it as a challenge to discover these identities for yourself, and they imply that d is closed under multiplication. D times D is contained in D, and of course the same thing will be true for N. However, that does not mean that D or N is a ring, because it may not contain the unit element that, you know, the AN need not be plus or minus one, and the same is true for the A0. However, if you join the unit element, well, then you see that this is actually a ring, I call it A, it is a ring, it is not only closed under multiplication, but it has also the unit element, and you see that D and N are ideals of A, because if you multiply D by A, you get Z times D, which is of course D itself, plus D times D, which is sitting in D. And the same for N. And you can also see that the difference between A and D is really very small. If you want to have a basis for A, maybe I should write that down first, then all you need to do is replace this zeroth basis vector by the unit element and the others you keep. So this is the sum from i is 1 to n minus 1 of z times pi. So you see that as an abelian group this a modulo d is a cyclic group of order the absolute value of a n. And it is a very easy exercise in algebra that if the additive group of a ring is isomorphic to a cyclic group, well, is cyclic, then actually these are isomorphic as rings. That is not difficult to show. And likewise, of course, A modulo N is isomorphic to Z modulo A naught, Z, and that is 
also as rings. Okay, then the next statement is I was announcing and I will now prove it that D and N are the denominator and the numerator of gamma and I will now tell you why that is and numerators and denominators they should be co-prime and that is what they are D and N are co-prime and so that means that the unit element is a sum of an element of D and an element of N and why is that? Well that should essentially already be on the blackboard, let me look the P's are in D and the Q's are in N so all the A's are in the sum and the A's they generate the group Z so the unit element is also in D plus N and that is sufficient and actually also necessary for D plus N to be equal to A. Okay and then we have the numerator and denominator question well Suppose that I look at this Pn minus 1 and I multiply it by gamma. Then you get the previous line except for the A0 which is sitting here. So this is equal to minus Q0. And in the same way if you take any P beyond the top line and I multiply it by gamma then I get minus the Q on the previous line so I guess this must be N minus 1 minus J and that involves all the P's and the Q's that you see except for those that are zero so that shows that we have that gamma times D is equal to N. So all that is lacking when you wish to call D the denominator is that we still have to show that D is invertible. So let's see whether we can prove that D is invertible. If I look at my A, that is D plus N, that is something I showed at the bottom right, and N is gamma D, so that is D plus D gamma, and that is the same as D times the ideal that we actually were motivated in. This is the ideal that we wanted to make invertible by blowing up. Because A is the blow up. This is, I didn't say that yet, but there is an argument which is in the notes and which is a little bit fiddling essentially with Gauss's lemma on polynomials over Z which enables you to show that if you can write an element in my field both as an integer polynomial in gamma and as an integer polynomial in gamma inverse then actually it will be a linear combination of these elements that form a basis of A. That is something in the notes, it is not difficult but I don't want to spend our time actually proving this. So this is the thing that we wanted to be invertible and lo and behold it is invertible, the inverse is D and that also shows that D is invertible so you see also now that the same is true when I interchange the roles of gamma and gamma inverse which is actually gotten from the previous line upon division by gamma. So that shows that D and N are co-prime invertible ideals and gamma, gamma 
The ideal generated by gamma is their quotient, the numerator divided by the denominator. Yeah, there is. Yeah, are there any questions about this? Okay, so there is one more thing that I would like to remark at this point, and that is that there is now an interesting group of invertible ideals of A, and I want to tell you which group that is and what is interesting about it, because that is something that I want to extend in the rest of the lecture and also in my lecture tomorrow. And that is the following. Let me introduce a notation. I of A, that is the set of invertible A ideals. So what you know, of course, is that when A is a dedicant ring, like OK, then uh, this will be a free abelian group generated by the maximal ideals of A. And yeah, that if you want to really do that, make this effective, then you need to find maximal ideals and do prime factorization. That is difficult, so we are in the process of finding a replacement for that. And you have to be careful here. I mentioned for a dedicant ring, this is a free group. For most orders, the exceptions are really exceptional. This group is not torsion free. It is torsion free if and only if the ring is in a very specific sense, very close to the full ring of integers. Maybe there is an exercise about it in the notes. Otherwise, we can invent one for you. So this is sort of a group that uh, you may not have as much control over as in the case that A is equal to OK. But in our situation, there is an interesting subgroup here, and that is generated by D and N. And that is free over Z with, well, of rank at most two, because it has two generators, and it has a basis, well, those elements of D and N that are qualified to be in the basis, so I take all axes in D and N that are not the unit ideal. X is not A. So if gamma and gamma inverse are both algebraic integers, so gamma is a unit, then the rank is zero. If gamma is an algebraic integer but its inverse is not, then n is a basis and there is no denominator. The other way around for gamma 